I just want to make them comfortable and feel like what they're about to go do is going to be a good thing for their career. You know, that I'm on their team and, and I want it to sound just as good as they do. That's Matt Rufino, the music mixer for the NBC Today Show. Matt's mixed over 4,000 songs and received five Emmys over the course of his 20 years working for the show. In this interview, we talk about how mixing music for broadcast differs from your typical record mix. They're out there and the people are right at their feet, so it's all about the fan reaction. Building that into the mix is important. Like, it's important for me to... Why he doesn't like to talk about the mix with the artist before they hear it for the first time. I'm not the guy for when you walk in the room to go, hey, check out this cool thing I did to your snare drum. I just rather hit play and let the mix speak for itself because if you tell them all the stuff you did, they're going to be listening for it. How the pandemic reignited his passion for making records with independent artists and how it ultimately led to him opening his own studio. I had all my gear. I had all my stuff. It was just sitting in my house doing nothing. And I had all this time. NBC sent me home and they're like, you know, it was seven months I was at home. And what the New York studio scene was like when he started verse today. As a runner, you know, you'd have a cart. You'd be pushing two inch, two inch reels of tape, you know, 15 reels from you know, Avatar to Clinton or to the Hit Factory or to whatever. Down the sidewalk. And they were all, yeah, yeah, right down the sidewalk. Lots of great mixing insights in this one, both technical and philosophical. So stick around for my interview with Matt Rafino. So you've mixed over 4,000 songs for the Today Show, which is crazy. My outside view of mixing broadcast versus music is that it's kind of a hybrid between live and studio. Is that... Do you feel like that's true? Or are there like main differences that you've noticed since you work in both worlds? Uh, yeah, it, 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 I treat it similar. Um, my template uh, for the studio is very similar to my template for live. I'm doing a lot of the same stuff as far as routing and um, EQ compression effects, all that sort of stuff is really similar. In broadcast, you're in 5.1 still. We're still in 5.1. I don't know who listens to it in 5.1, but we're airing it in. <laughs> So I'm doing a 5-1 mix every morning that no one hears. Everyone's listening to the stereo, obviously, on like an iPad. But it's a similar approach. It's a hybrid. Uh, the starting process is a little different. With live, the first thing I'm listening to is how everything is bleeding into each other. And, you know, really on the lead vocal. What does the lead vocal have in there? Is it cymbals? Is it snare drum? Is it sub from a subwoofer off a side fill? Oh, yeah. And then I'm going to try to make the voice as good as I can. And then as I bring everything else up, I'm going to EQ that around the voice because maybe there's a bunch of cymbal that I can't get out of that vocal microphone or the background vocals are right by the drummer and it's all hi-hat. So then I'm going to treat the drums differently with those mics open than if it was a studio thing where they're isolated and you're going to want to add top end and you're going to you're not going to need that so it's just how you bring stuff up and how you listen to them i find in the studio I, it's the same process for me only i'm trying to get the initial tracks to sound like i recorded them before i start mixing them and it's it's the same sort of process i'm trying to find the sound within the track and then once I can bring that to life enough, I can put everything together and then really actually start mixing and EQing. And I don't know if that makes sense. No, that, that actually makes a lot of starting with the vocal and listening to the bleed actually makes a ton of sense. I would have not would not have done that, but everybody should do that. <laughs> that's definitely the way to go. I That's how I mix <laughs> records now. I start with the vocal and I kind of create a scene with the vocal first. I at least get some basic EQ compression and whatever effects around it. And then I can just build around it. And instead of trying to cram it in last minute, like I used to, it's there all the time. I'm mixing with it, the vocal on almost always. Do you have time to tweak mixes between rehearsal and live sometimes? Yes. Yeah, so we do, it depends on, we do inside performances and outside performances. Inside's in our studio and those could air in the eight, nine or 10 o'clock hour. Outside performances are in Rockefeller Center. Uh, if you were looking at the stage, the Christmas tree would be right behind the stage, mm. like the Rockefeller tree, if it was up. That's where our stage is. And those we have, it's a tight window. We rehearse from 6.30 a.m. to 7. So whatever, say they're doing five songs that morning. I've got to dial up, let's say it's a 70 input band. I got to dial up all the mic trees and all the instruments and get that dialed up with like a rough fader mix. And we'll record the rehearsal. I'll multi-track it. 7 a.m., we got to be done because the show starts. 
So it's got to be over with. As the show is on the air, I'm playing back the multi-track into my, onto my console and building the mix mm. off that multi-track. I'll have about 55 minutes to do that mix, and then we're going to tape our first song. Wow. And then I'll get about another 15 minutes or so to work on the other three songs. So I'll save snapshots for those real quick, and we're done. We're the in-studio stuff, I've got a few hours. I've got like two or three hours. So I'm mixing it more like a record. Plus, they're inside. There's no audience. It's a tighter space. Uh, you have more room to play, more time to play, so you can get more creative and do more of a studio-style thing where the live stuff, I'm building it around the crowd, the ambience in the plaza, really trying to make it sound like it looks. Oh, okay. Concrete and glass around. Uh, you know, you're on a city block in New York City. Right. If it was going to sound, if you just bring up the close mics, it's going to sound like dry mics and you're looking down the street. It's not going to appear correct. So if you're actually listening in 5-1, you would hear my crowd front to back. You would hear reverbs bouncing from the front to the back, you know, trying to make it so you're sitting in the middle of the audience. That's cool. Um, for the and you can kind of hear that. Hear the five one. <laughs> yeah. Basically for me and the band's, you know, manager. That, that's a, well, okay. So talking about the five one, obviously you have to mix it in five one because that's how it's being broadcast. But the your fold down must be like super important. Are you actually spending most of your time listening to the fold down? Or do you just know how they all go together now at this point? I know how they go together, but over time we've kind of reverted closer back to stereo. They used to make us put vocal in the center channel. Mm. Like that was what they required. But then people realized anyone with an HDMI converter could steal like a lead vocal and put it on the internet. So there was some tapes going around at one point of stuff. So we kind of stopped doing that. And I basically mix like stereo with the subwoofer through a little LFE. And then my rears and centers are just ambience and effects at this point. This way, my down mix is going to be accurate musically. So at this point, those your surrounds are probably, they're just settings that you probably like and maybe room mics. Is that what you're doing with all that other space? Yeah, I have the A2 set up like six different large diaphragm condensers around the plaza that go from front to back. Oh, okay. And I've got two in the front, two in the middle, two in the rear. Okay. You know, pan left and right. And those will be on a VCA all linked together. You know, I'll have those kind of grouped EQ wise and compressor wise together and do a thing with those. And then I'm riding that during the whole performance because it's all about the crowd on the show. They're, you know, we always have like a truss with the runway and they're out there and the people are right at their feet. So it's all about the fan reaction. Right, right. Uh, so building that into the mix is important. Like, it's important for me to EQ the audience to my mix so I can get them as loud as I can without it turning into mush. Uh, wait, what what kind of, uh, we're just going to go straight to the nerdy weeds here. What kind of EQ moves okay. are you making to get a lot of more audience than, you know, you would normally get? It's just whatever the Brainworks 9000 SSL you know, high pass filter, low mid cut, low cut. It's nothing fancy, low okay. limiter and fast mode. It's not, it's nothing crazy with it. Sometimes if you have to, if I got like one guy who's screaming into a, a mic, like, and he's right there, like I'll throw an L1 on it or something or a multiband. But normally it's, at, that's sort of at the end of the mix I'm doing that. And if there's not a lot of time, you know, I'm spending more time on the lead vocal than the crowd. And are you able to, I mean, if somebody's playing to a click, are you able to do any rides and have time code oh, yeah. drive some of that stuff? I don't have time code ride it. There was some funny things that were going on with that. Okay. Technically that I didn't like that didn't make me comfortable, but I'm changing the tempo for every song. All my delays are in time. I've got, I've got this huge template and it has everything that you could possibly imagine in it. It's super overkill because I work on different styles of music every day. Right. So I load up the same thing and my lead vocal has 20 effects sitting there being sent to all the time. And I'm on a digital console, a Lavo digital console, but I've also got a S3 or whatever off to my side. And that just set up on a fader bank that's 16 vocal effects returns. So when I'm mixing, I can just blend up and down. You Oh, you want a slap? Sure. Here, here's a slap. You want, here's a stadium. Here's a this, here's a that. 
Yeah. And I've got everything. Oh, can you put a phaser? Sure. Oh, you want a Leslie? And I just have everything there ready to go. And I can just work really quick with that. And I do the same thing on a record. That's yeah. how, like, when I said I set the scene for the vocal, I'm doing quick EQ and compression and then trying to find is this drier? Is this wetter? Is this wider? Is it? And then I'll kind of just create really quickly with my fingers in two seconds without even looking at a plug in. And then I'll go fine tune and change pre delay and whatever yeah sort of stuff but yeah the main stuff is happening fast and in, in sort of chunks that's the way that i like to work in records and you know it's like let, let's just talk about like workflow template for a second uh for people like i just find that like the first hour is like really important so to have a lot of like things that i can like you said just push faders up and create a vibe i feel like that first hour gets so much more work done as opposed to when i was a kid and it's like i'm gonna make another r verb and I'm going to send the, the blah, blah, blah. It's like those little tweaks that allow you to do what you're talking about, especially maybe there's a manager in the room or, or you know that the band's going to walk off stage and want to hear playback of that rehearsal. Like it's got to be a vibe and you're working faster than, you know, most people in, in a studio. It's, it's funny when you start out, you start out with like, I'm going to high pass this and super cut all these notches out of this stuff. Yeah. And you start with the little things. I think as you get more experience, you do big picture and you break it down and it gets down to the little centimeter stuff at the end. Oh, that thing has got a little frequency. I'm still hearing. Let me notch it out. Or instead of doing it right away, if you get the vibe of the whole thing first, it's the same thing in the studio with automation or whatever. As you're going, you're getting finer detail, finer detail, finer detail until you've hit everything. Yeah. If yeah. you try to do those fine details, nothing blends, nothing fits. But you kind of have to do that for a long time to learn. It's like you have to do that. You have to go through those phases. I agree. Where you multiband stuff too much or where you EQ stuff too much right away or you focus on one thing too much and then you learn it. And then for me, it's like once I've learned that or I spent that time with that and that part of my mixing career is over. It's just in a file cabinet in the back and I can grab it whenever I need that thing. Instead of on everything all the time, it's for the one thing when you need it. Yeah. But if you don't know how to do it and you didn't overkill it, how do you know how to quickly do it? And in your mind go, that's what I need to do. And I'm going to do it now right away. And just, you know, I think that's like longevity of doing it. Yeah. Well, it's just experience. I, I, I had this, this thought, I, I did a social media TikTok post the other day. Uh, about the three stages of a mixed career. And it's like when you're first starting out, like you overdo everything. You think that you know better than the client. You ruin everything. But you're also working with people that don't know any different. And what you're giving them is way better than what they made. But that's where you learn all that stuff. And then you kind of move on from there to the point where you're like, okay, I've now over compressed the shit out of everything and notched every vocal frequency I could ever notch. Now I'm just going to like make the rough mix a little bit better. And that works because the people you're working with, they're like, don't change it. We like it. And then like after you clear through that, you get into that like the freedom returns where you've figured the tools out. You've now go, gone over the top not doing anything. And then you can kind of actually put your stamp on something while respecting what they made. So it's great. There's so many things that we can do. I mean, if you just pick an instrument, any instrument, yeah. there's 100,000 different ways to do it. You can't do them all in one mix. So it's knowing what they do and how they make things sound and how they react and knowing when you need that thing. Yeah, yeah. And totally. that's just, to me, that's chair time. That's just doing it over and over and over. Like you said, I've mixed 4,000 songs or whatever. I mean, it's with studio stuff, probably close to 5,000 songs or whatever. And it's just the chair time of screwing so many things up and making so many mistakes, but learning you know, it's like I always tell the interns and stuff around here, like, are you going to go home and mix tonight? Are you going to mix something? Yeah. Like, when you're done here, like, you should have download a multi-track and be mixing because like, you just need the time. Mm -hmm. It's the reps. You need all all those reps. So I, a question uh, kind of relating back to the Today Show, but then also, you know, on topic with where we are, you have a very small window of time to get those mixes together, and you've been doing it for a long time. How do you decide 
what the most important elements are. The first pass you listen to something, you're like, okay, this is the moment here. This is the moment here. This is the moment here. And, and does that translate over to your music work? Do you make those decisions like instinctively very quickly now? I would say so. I mean, it's nice being in the studio to have more time to reflect on it or take it home for the night and listen to it in the car and come back and make changes where you don't have that with live. And if you didn't make the right choice, it's that's what it is forever. Yeah. You know, the songs usually dictate it. The artist dictates it. The style dictates it. I'm not going to work on some auxiliary part when everyone... And the other thing is, too, a lot of these songs I'm mixing are hit songs that people know. So now I'm having to compete with the blah, blah, blah mix of it, the Serban mix of it, or the whatever, insert, you know, rock star mixer here who's yeah. like legendary guys, and I got to do that in, in like an hour. And so I've... <laughs> sort of learn that you know that the bonus of having mixed all these songs is a lot of them being hits i've kind of learned where the the bodies are buried in these types of productions where all <laughs> the little elements are where they live and where how i can use them in other mixes down the road because it's a hit song so obviously it worked it translated to people the production was great and now i've learned oh they had this going on in the chorus, you know, let me try that on this thing. So you learn. It's great because I thought coming up in, in the late 90s and early 2000s, I wanted to be like rock and roll engineer. You know, you could make a living just making rock records, a pretty good living. Yeah. Um, more than some mixers make now, mixing the records. Just as an engineer, you could make that type of living. I thought that's what I was going to do, and it didn't really work out that way, and I'm Looking back now, very pleased because I've mixed so many styles of music, even stuff I don't like. I've just got to learn about music, learn about things I never would have ever listened to. I'll, I, and I'll never listen to now, stuff that's not ever going to get turned on in my car. I've mixed more of that than stuff that will. Yeah. But it's just like I'm so thankful that, you know, last week I worked on like seven different styles of music. That's cool. Between the studio and, and here in like a six-day period. Yeah. All completely different. Nothing of the same genre at all. And I'm comfortable doing all of it. There's not like, uh, I don't know. It's, I kind of do know at this point because I've seen a, enough of it at least where I can fake my way through it. Well, you're also, you're, you're at a very high level. So it's like, if you're, you know, you can't say that you didn't niche down because you're, you're the, the artists you're dealing with are top tier artists. You have to do pop to that level you have to do hip-hop to that level you can't like just be doing everything in your town to like 50 percent like you're gonna have somebody's gonna come in that room and be like this doesn't sound like my record and you need to solve that in like five minutes so yeah you have to kind of know how to do every little trick <laughs> that's probably like if i ever get a compliment when they come in and go this sounds better than the album like that's that's like about as good as it gets for me in that that chair that's awesome uh, because i'm not you know, dealing, I'm dealing, when I'm dealing with the artist, it's sometimes fast. If yeah. I see them at all, sometimes I don't see them at all. It, it really depends. Uh, so I just want to make them comfortable and feel like what they're about to go do is going to be a good thing for their career. Yeah. You know, that's going to be, you know, that I'm on their team and, and I want it to sound just as good as they do. Well, it's pretty regularly, probably like a album premiere. It's usually some kind of debut thing. I would imagine when somebody's hitting the Today Show, it's like, it's a big press moment for them. They need it to be great. Yeah, yeah. The, everyone's, you know, sinking in money, promoting their new project. And, you know, everyone is there. The label's there. The uh, A&R guy's there. If it's a big deal like that, you know, everyone is there. The manager's there. The publicist is there. Everyone's yeah. coming in. Everyone wants to hear it. Here's a question. You're, you're naming off a lot of roles and I know I've done this for one band. They were on a show. And obviously, I'm not in that union. I can't mix that. Uh, but they sent me to listen to it. Do you get that a lot? Do you get oh, yeah. Every day. band representatives? How does that interaction work? Is it is it stressful when someone's in there who mixed the record? Or is the engineer? Or is it you're just like, whatever, I no. do every day? Hopefully, they're cool. And they'll give me the... If, if it, it's an in-studio thing where we have time... I try to just like, let me do my thing. And once it's done, you guys come in and I'll change it any way that you like. Cause I kind of have my groove and I do my thing. And you know how it is. If the musician's there, they're not going to understand why you're focusing on something or <laughs> why. So just, I'd rather, and I don't like to tell people what I'm doing. I'm not 
secretive about it. If you have a question, I'll tell you exactly what I did, but I'm not the guy for when you walk in the room to go, hey, check out this cool thing I did to your snare drum. I just rather hit play and let the mix speak for itself. Because if you tell them all the stuff you did, they're going to be listening for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and now you're done. You're just going down a rabbit hole because it's going to be like, oh, I don't know. Is it cool? Is it not cool? Where if you just hit play and it feels like their song and they get their vibe off of it and it sounds like them, then we're going to be good. And it's usually at that point, oh, man, it sounds great. You know, can you bring up the background vocals in the chorus or can you add this extra delay? Uh, it's got to the point where it's it's not a lot of requests for changes. It's... You know, when I first started, it would be a lot more. But at this point, I'm pretty dialed in. Before we move on, I, I had this this thought came to me this morning because I saw that the show was in 5.1 and you mentioned it. Do you see broadcast embracing Atmos? Is that even possible? I've heard some shows talking about doing it, but not like we're doing it. We're not investing in it. Right. I don't even know where I stand with Atmos yet. Um, <laughs> I think it could be really cool. No one's asking me for it, and I know a lot of the artists that I do work with on today's show are not really happy with it either, um, from what I've heard. Yeah. I'm not going to name names, but major artists that are not into, you know, they're being forced to do it, basically. And not being so, able to hear it, usually. They're just like, okay, what'd you do to it? I don't know what it sounds yeah, like. Yeah, and, and I've said this like 100 million times, I just don't. My my concern with it is my kids have never asked me for a speaker, let alone a room full of speakers. And HGTV is not telling us it looks great to hang speakers from our ceilings. So my wife's not going to be into it. So if the wife and kids don't like it, it seems to become like rich guy media room thing again to do like a real system. Yeah. And then it's like, well, so we're just mixing for a compromise listening environment. And I, I don't quite get that, but I'm not saying it couldn't be great. I'm not saying it's not going to be the future. I don't know. I'm not going to go out and buy the speakers until I see it happen because I mix in a format every day that's been dead for 15 years. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not knocking it. If you're doing it and you're making a living doing it, great for you. I think that's awesome. Maybe yeah. I'll do it. I'm not saying I'm not, but yeah, I'm not there yet. Yeah, hey, I'm, I've done a few. I'm, I'm set up in here because I did a couple records last year, and uh, it's a lot of fun as a mixer. And it's not a lot of fun to communicate with other people about it because they're like, what am I listening for? I'm like, well, you're listening to what you're going to hear in AirPods. If you want to come over to my house, you can hear the speakers. And they're like, I, I don't, I, I'll just listen to this. And they're like, I don't like it. It sounds kind of roomy. I don't know. To me, I think the only way that it survives is if that, that binaural experience starts to reflect the speaker experience because I don't I'm I'm guessing you've probably been in a room. It's fucking awesome when you're in a room. And it's like if you could make the I headphones. I haven't heard a full system. I have not oh. even heard a full system yet. Yeah. I Oh it's... yeah. You gotta get you gotta find one in New York. Just go go listen to a few things because it's really cool. See, the, what what gives me I'm a concern. I, I I spent ten years trying to figure out how to get the down mix right in five one. And it's like, I just don't want to go through that process again, to be honest with you. I mean, it's hard. It it's not hard. easy making a lot of speakers translate down to two or yep. making making them both work correctly. You can make the 5-1 kick in and then two to the down mix. And it's like, oh, the guitars are starting to disappear. It's like, well, yeah, because we you wanted them wide. So we panned them a little bit to the back. And then the down mix flips them out of phase and monos them. In Dolby, so from 5.1. So now they're starting to get half phased in mono and they're going to disappear. We yeah. can pick one way or the other. And until they come up with this magic system that just down mixes it and it's perfect, it's always going to be a compromise. And it's, I'm, I'm so sick of mixing for a compromise. Yeah. I know that yeah. sounds like yeah. silly because you're talking about like 15 speakers or whatever. And that's supposed to be, as engineers, we're supposed to be like more speakers. Yeah. But if the people can't hear it that way, I don't know. I, I agree. Like I said, I hope it works. I hope they find a way to make it work because it's fun. But but yeah, like to use all the speakers in the room, you're doing things that you would never do in stereo. There's added, like, look at your outdoor shows. You're, you have room mics filling up your space behind you. Yeah, I'm and Atmos I'm doing five one reverbs. Yeah, or I'm doing four stereo reverbs with different pre-delays panned into different speakers or the same thing with delays. And then I'm grouping them and riding them up and down. 
And it's like cool. It's fun and creative as an engineer to do that stuff. But you're just when it folds down, it's you're just you get into this wash. When it folds down, it doesn't sound. I don't know anyone that's told me they've like loved the fold down. As far as I, I know, I don't know anyone. And then on top of it, kids are not asking for it. Yeah. And if they're not, when I grew up, like as a kid in the eighties and nineties, your biggest appliance in your bedroom was your stereo. Mm-hmm. Like that's what you had. You know, your bike and your stereo. Now they have iPads and all this other stuff. They don't even care about. It. They don't want a stereo. It's all on there with their earbuds. So they're not even like maybe they want like a little JBL Bluetooth speaker, but they're not sitting and they're not sitting in front of the speakers listening to an album. Yeah. Like that doesn't exist. It's on in the background while they're playing a video game or while and that's going to be it's sort of like appointment television. Our generation and older like you thought, "Oh, well Seinfeld's on Thursday night, so I'm going to be home on Thursday night to watch Seinfeld." No kid in this generation has ever had that. No, that's so weird to they think They know about. they hit play. So they just hit play. So it's a whole new world coming, and no one's conditioned for that. Yeah, that's interesting. I never really thought about that. Yeah, you can just watch everything's on demand. And if it's not on demand, then I don't want to be part of it. It's crazy. And sitting down somewhere to do something, people don't have that attention span. I think that's why you see less musicians and more digital musicians. When you have an iPad and you're a kid and you pick up your iPad, you can play a game and get instant gratification. You can do that with music, too. Mm -hmm. It takes you how many... Eddie Van Halen spent his whole life sitting in his bedroom practicing guitar eight hours a day to become Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. That's incredible, but when you've got this in your face going instant gratification, instant gratification, it's hard to really... It's going to whittle down how many people are going to put the time in. Yeah. It sort of whittles down who's going to spend the time sitting there and then listening to it in front of two speakers or 14 speakers or whatever it is. That's true. That's true. Well, okay. I mean, I guess, like, do you think it matters if somebody makes something on an iPad in 10 minutes or they make it in, let's not say Pro Tools, it's GarageBand for five hours? Like, we, I mean, it all comes down to the music, obviously. Yeah, no, if it's good, if it's good. I just mean from the standpoint of putting in the time, we're just less patient as human beings in this modern world. Yeah. So, yeah, music is going to get created that way because AI and because of everything else. Why, when you have people doing the steps for you, it's human nature to just let the steps be done and not put in the hard work, right? That's why so many people go to the gym in January. <laughs> And luckily that's over. <laughs> yes. Amen. <laughs> Thank God. Uh, oh, you, okay. You mentioned Jim. I wanted to ask you about that. Cause I know I listened to your working class audio interview at the gym this morning cool. and uh, cool. it sounds like exercise is pretty important to you. You obviously work super long hours. You also have a family. How long have you been like kind of health focused and was it because, because you were overworking, did you start to have problems? I know I had like knee problems and now exercising kind of has changed, you know, my working pains. Is that how you got into it or? No, I guess when I was in my late twenties, I quit smoking cigarettes and started putting on weight. So I went to the gym and I just really got into it. And I've been into it since I fell off during COVID and then I had some health stuff and it was like hard getting back into it. And The last year, I've been kind of really back full time, and I'm starting to get back into like normal shape for me. Nice, yeah. I I I really encourage like all musicians, engineers in particular. I mean, we just fucking sit all day, and like I have done, like I've taken a toll on my body and had see a noticeable change in actively exercising for like the last three or four years. Not to mention, like I feel better and I sleep better, and like I don't know why musicians they they don't like exercising. Yeah, diet too. Like I put in a really long day every day and I can't, when I'm eating a crap diet and not working out, I'm not doing good, as good of work. I agree. It, it's, I'm tired. I'm la- I mean, I'm always a little tired, but I'm, I'm dragging. I don't feel as good when I'm working out. I try to, between NBC and when I get to my studio, I, I usually get like an hour of workout in every day. That's good. Um, yeah, I really, at least four days a week, four or five days a week. And then during COVID, I put a little gym in the basement. So I do that on the weekends instead of going to the gym. I just work out at home. But yeah, I try to keep it, keep 
a part of my life. If you could say one thing to the person that says they can't find 30, 45, 60 minutes to work out, what would you say? Oh, man, it's better than spending like two weeks in the hospital for something because you're not doing well. I just think for me, I don't, you know, I, for me, it's like it's it's like getting, you know, it's like gets you high. It makes you feel better. It does. It does. It makes it, it, yeah. it you know, it just makes me feel kind of like pumped to get ready to do the second half of my day. Because for me, I do it in the middle of the day. I would imagine if I did it first thing in the morning, it would get me like pumped up to do, you know, my day that way. So it it, it just gives you a, like pumps up the endorphins, you know, and you just feel better. Agreed. Well, it's also probably a nice divider for you. You just you just left corporate mixed land to go to like your studio and, and mix music, which is a good segue to talk about the fact that you you work on records on like the back half of the day and work on TV in the front half. Something that I found in my career is I was always doing engineering sessions, songwriting pop sessions, and like people just never looked at me as a mixer, even though that's what I did all day while I was recording their vocals. And that's what I wanted to do until I basically just stopped doing engineering gigs to just say, I mix. Okay, guys, everybody, I mix. Do you run into to issues where people are like, oh, Matt's like the TV guy, he's crushing it. Like he doesn't have time to do a record or he doesn't do rock. He does all this TV stuff. Like how do you work that balance where you kind of have to have two uh, brands for lack of a better word? It's difficult. It's definitely a difficult thing. When I started, I started out making records and did that, you know, starting as an intern and then an assistant and did the whole deal. And when I went freelance and I was working enough to sustain myself, I was, I was working at a good studio and getting plenty of work. And then NBC started happening and it got to the point where NBC was just giving me more and more work. And when they made me a staff engineer, um, I think I was a little burnt out. It was the end of the two thousands and the labels were dying out. Everything was changing. Streaming wasn't there yet budgets were shrinking and I was like, well, I'll just do this and make a living doing TV. And I sort of like whatever reason, just stopped doing records and just focused on TV. And I did that for like 10 years. And I think inside it was always bugging me, but I was in this world doing this thing. And it was like, it's hard to, it's hard to like, complain when you're mixing major artists every day right it's not like you're doing not doing your thing but mm. i was missing something and i knew it and i kind of came out of some personal stuff and covid happened and i was like i just got to start making records again like i had all my gear i had all my stuff it was just sitting in my house doing nothing and i had all this time nbc sent me home and they're like you know it was seven months i was at home so i built a studio and started talking to people that I used to work with. And I picked up a thing and picked up another thing. And one thing led to another. And I started getting more gear and building the studio more. And, and it just sort of became a full-time business again. And yeah, sometimes people don't, you know, they'll reach out to me and they think because I've worked with this person, this person, this person, like I'm, my rate's too high for them or why would I work with them if I've worked with this person? So there is a fine line. And I think when you disappear from making records that long, just no one knows you. No one and everyone in the TV world would know me. You know, all the people that work around the bands for that, but not in the record world. So I basically had to start from scratch again, like doing free mixes and, you know, trying everything I could do to just build up a client base again. Yeah. And it's hard when like one day, you're mixing Kelly Clarkson and then later that day, some like local bands like, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, it was hard. It took me a while, but now I'm, I'm in a good groove with it where I have, this year has been crazy already. I can't believe it. Um, but yeah, I've just been really fortunate that it's picked up and hoping to keep at it. Are, are your workflows, there's there's probably a lot of overlap, but I, I see a lot of gear behind you. I'm guessing maybe there's less gear at at NBC. Are, are you more analog rock and roll at your place with a, a different approach? or? Uh, it, NBC is all digital. I'm basically, I have a digital console, but I use a Pro Tools rig, like a plug-in server, basically. So everything is connected to my digital desk via Maddie. 
So every channel has a MADI insert, which is a Pro Tools AUGS input with the fader at zero, and it's got my signal chains on it. And then the bus output of my console feeds back into that Pro Tools rig to all my groups and buses and effects returns. I go all my effects sends on the desk, feed all my effects. And once it's in Pro Tools, then it stays in there and sums down to a master fader that feeds broadcast. So mm -hmm. this way, my delay compensation is lined up. It's in and out once and then back out of the desk into Pro Tools. And once it's in Pro Tools, it's lined up. So I never have to change any, you know, Pro Tools delay compensation does everything for me. Cool. So it's really great. And I'm basically just using the desk, like faders, panning, aug sends and groups and everything else is in Pro Tools. Here, I'm mixing completely in Pro Tools uh, on a 24 fader, D control, D command, whatever it is. And um, yeah, I've got a ton of analog. I used to run it in a full hybrid setup and it just got too cumbersome yeah. with the converters. You know, I was running like 96 channels of IO to get all this gear in and out. And the converters, the delay compensation was getting kind of flaky. And like I'd have to shut the converters on and off and the timing would change. And so now I pretty much run an analog mix bus through Pro Tools. If I want some of my gear, I patch it in and print it. Maybe if it's like one or two inserts, a lot of times I'll have the lead vocal running live, the bass running live, but everything else. I'm not running really any stereo stuff anymore. A couple of effects processors that they just don't have plugins for and everything else I just print. But yeah, I like the gear. I like both. I'm I'm comfortable doing either way. I don't think there's any right or wrong. Yeah. I, you know, whatever works. I like the idea of printing, you know, I, I used to do a hybrid as well, and I just kind of got away from it because just the recall is, I don't know why I never thought about printing it. And then towards the end of my hybrid days, I was like, okay, we're on mix two. Nobody said anything about the vocal. I'm printing this chain, moving on, you know. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good a good workflow. Yeah, yeah, I do like I do like that way. Um my mix bust I moved to all like mastering grade stuff, so it's all fixed knob. And yeah. I run a big calibration template I have in Pro Tools, so all my gear gets calibrated. Oh. Um so that's how I used to do it in hybrid. I had um a template that I'd open up every morning that had a tone signal generator in the first slot and then the hardware insert in the second. And in the comments, it would just say what the gain reduction should be and what the return to Pro Tools should be in calibration mode. And I would just, and that was my recall every day. That's cool. So what, uh, describe that process a little bit more, both for me and for other people. How were you making those choices on gain reduction and, and level? Is it just based on like, you're always basically using the same settings? Based on other mixes, kind of where stuff was set, you know, obviously stereo stuff, I want to be left and right totally balanced. I'm like a real stickler for, like, I'm, I'm not a very technical person, but if I'm running anything in analog, it's not worth going out of the plugin if you're not going to have your gear totally calibrated because your stereo image is just going to get screwed up and there goes your your height and your width and your depth, like, right out the window. So the process just basically is... Uh, you know, it's really similar to um, like kind of how Brower calibra uh, calibrates all his stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just every one of my inserts I had that way. So the gear was set to like one setting and I was going to okay. use it or not. And right. this way I could do 10 songs in a day. And once I'm calibrated for the day, I never. And even like you get to the point when you're grooving and it's going the calibration, like I'm like tapping a knob here or there at the beginning of the day because it's like a tenth of a db off right and the gear just after a while just sort of settles in and if it wasn't i'd probably still be doing that if it wasn't for the pro tool stuff getting all weird and i was just spending too much time dealing with it and not enough time mixing yeah yeah totally it, it just came down to that like i just got to mix more so what can i get rid of so what i did is i just started a being my inserts with plugins and a lot of times the analog beat the plugin out, but not summed into Pro Tools together. That's mm. what I found. Like if I had a parallel 1176 on something, soloed, my real one sounded better. But in the mix, the balance was better with the plugins because the latency was better. So the initial track sounded better. And I'm uh -huh. running HDX and everything else. And 
but I don't have avid converters, so that was part of the rub. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. For uh, for our audience, just to let them know that analog is different every day. When you do that calibration, you're actually tweaking knobs every every morning, or when you used to do it, I guess. Yeah, well, I would turn the gear on, let it warm up for like an hour while I was doing other stuff, and then that whole time this template would be open and tone would be shooting through the gear. And then you just turn on calibration mode in Pro Tools under setup or options or whatever it is. Yeah. And if you look at the bottom screen, it shows down to a tenth of dB how much signal is going through. So I just have to look at the comments and go, okay, my distressors are going to be 1 dB of compression and return at minus 17.5. So from the input till you hear minus 1 and then the output till minus 17.5. Yeah, And I did everything on its own mono fader so I could totally calibrate anything that's in stereo. Uh, I could calibrate, you know, pretty much once I had it set, it, it worked great. It was just really the, it was the digital side, not the analog, that was becoming too cumbersome for me, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. That's, that's good. Uh, I, I wanted a uh, hard subject change. Okay. I just did a video, I think you said you watched it about setting rates. And you and I both have been in a situation. I worked. I was on staff at Capital for a long time. Yep. Where, uh, you know, we we know we're making money. We're being told what our rates are. We're not negotiating. And then you get into the freelance world where it's like, can I get the same? Can I get more? How how is that balance for you between, you know, knowing what you should be charging outside of your normal gig? Is having a salaried gig for everybody like what? How are those two worlds, you know, for you? It's two different vibes completely. I mean, honestly, the majority of my income still is from NBC uh, as far as like it's just a better rate than what a lot of indie artists can afford to pay. I also sort of went into this again, knowing that to me, I already have income. So this wasn't this was more for me. Yeah. Than it was about the money. So I wasn't so much worried about rates in the beginning. It was more like, just let me work with good people and that will all work itself out. And it more or less has, you know, would I like to charge more per mix? Yeah. Well, I in the future, probably, but I'm still in this, like, I look at it as like, I started completely over in 2020. So like, even though I started in 1995, 2020, it was year one. So I'm in like year three right now. Okay. I look at it as like, I don't touch any money really that I make from the studio business. That's all put back into the business or just put into savings, uh, pay my rent, all that sort of stuff. And I look at that as sort of like a separate thing. And my television money that pays my mortgage, that supports my family, that does all that sort of stuff. Right. And I'm living two lives right now. Eventually, you know, hopefully as time goes on, I'll be living one life down the road as I get older because I can't keep doing this forever <laughs> to a uh, two um, eight hour days stacked on on top of each other with the gym in between <laughs> yeah yeah 17 hours is a long day totally uh be before we hit our closing questions you got to tell us uh, about your studio so despite the fact that you have a, a full-time gig you have leased a commercial space and you have stacks of gear that you've been collecting for years you want and i know you said you wanted to get back into making records but what made you want to get that commercial space and then go I mean you you dove in when, when when I stopped doing records I had a B room in a commercial space and I just always like you know I, I came up at Avatar Studios which is the power station now and was and it was like five awesome rooms humming all day long of stuff going on I mean you know if you work the Capitol I've never been there but I'm assuming it's the same vibe where it's like you turn the corner and there's John Mayer and you turn the other corner and there's JLo and there's just like always stuff going on. And I just wanted to, especially after COVID, I was locked in my basement mixing for months on end. I just wanted to get back into creative space. I wanted to make it more of this isn't a hobby. This is my business. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm doing. This is not like something on the side. I wanted to be in a better room, better tuned room. I mean, there was a lot of positives for me that it worked. Yes. Could I save the money on rent every month? Sure. Could I do it from home? Absolutely. But this sort of separates it. Yeah. For me. And I just, I came up my whole life. I, I got my first gig in a recording studio when I was 14. Like that's 
what I do. That's where I like to be. It's like, it feels like home to me. Um, more than home sometimes. Yeah. 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 That, that, that's all. There is, there's a nice separation when you, you leave home and you go to a place and it's also and it's nice great to when have people, people come. People, yeah. yeah. You know, I've got a band coming in tomorrow. I had a band in on Monday. It's nice to not like have to tell my wife, like, you know, can you go to the in-laws this weekend? Uh, you know, I need the living room to do guitar overdubs. I, I, I can't, I, can't, I, I it, it's great. And then plus I gave me my basement back. So we got the basement back because I moved all my instruments here. I've got a lot of stuff I've been collecting my whole life. So it's yeah. just sort of through the years. It's a lot. And when yeah. you've got like 30 guitars, just imagine where you put 30 guitar cases. One piece of gear, like the studio's on fire. You can only take one thing. What are you taking? Oh, Probably my computer. I mean, let's be real. Uh, you know, <laughs> if I my my computer, my speakers, and my Trinov, because with those I could work anywhere. So you love the Trinov then? I do. Um, you know, I thought all the DSP stuff was gonna be kind of weird, and my home studio was kind of funky, and I did Sonar Works, mm -hmm. and I could hear it. To me, yeah, like I, I like felt like I heard some weird phasing thing. It helped. My room was really bad. It helped. It, it helped me get through a lot of stuff. I'm not knocking it. When I came here, I really struggled. The speakers I had were not good for this room. They had a dip in the same range the room had a dip in. Mm. And I, the first three months I was here, I couldn't make anything sound decent. Like I was freaking out. I was like, I just moved to this place. I don't know what I'm doing. Like this is over. What did I do? And so I changed speakers and that helped. And then a buddy of mine uh, was telling me about the Trinov and how you know, he's in a pro space. And he's like, even in my room, it changed things so much. So I took the gamble on it. And I just told you, it'd be one of the three pieces that comes out of here if I had to leave. And I got a lot of stuff, but yeah. I think that would be, it just, you know, even if it's not doing anything, it gives me the confidence that, you know, I feel like what I'm doing is correct. Maybe that's maybe that's worth every dollar of admission on it. I don't know. Yeah, um, yeah. But I rarely get like tone recalls. Yes. Yeah. Like I don't get like maybe okay every once in a while maybe there's too much low end or whatever. But it's never like this is really bright or this is dark or this is no. It's just more creative stuff yeah. I get since I got that thing. Not not once. So I think it's great. Yeah, monitoring is so important. And for anybody that's listening, the Trinov is it's like basically a DSP time alignment and EQ room analysis, like fairly pretty, what it does pretty expensive. for the for the phase is what to me is them because my this room was done by Francis Manzella, who was a great studio designer, so it was already pretty good. It's a smaller room, but it was already pretty good. And then I used the analyzer to get my sub, get everything as flat as I could. Mm -hmm. So frequency wise, this thing is not going crazy, but this room has something weird in the mid range with the phase that this fixed and like stuff like snare drums and hand claps. It sounds like the speakers are broken with it off. Oh, I don't know how to describe it. And it's yeah. not even like, oh my God, the low end gets perfect now. Or It's already pretty good. I'm in a good spot. Yeah, uh, but what it's doing to the phase and I guess the time alignment and I like to work with my door open a lot. So I have a preset for door open and door closed. And <laughs> what cool. the imaging does is incredible. I'm telling you, like I you leave the door open preset on when it's open. When you when you hit the button on the preset, it's like the whole image shifts to the wrong spot Whoa. when you open and close the door. It's wild. It's It's totally wild. I don't know what it's doing, but... I, I it's awesome. Um, I did want to ask you because you you came up New York, New Jersey. You've been in that area, uh, I think your whole life, right? How, yeah. Yep. How's that scene? How's the New York scene different now than it was like ten, fifteen years ago? Everything's so expensive in L.A. and New York. Is there it, is there is no scene it's, anymore? It's hurting. Like when I was a kid, like in the nineties, there were so many places to go see shows, and it was like anything you wanted. You know, you wanted to see a punk band, you wanted to see a jam band, you wanted to see a rock, like they had everything and there was clubs and there was places for ba bands could afford to live. You know, I mean, when I was working at Avatar, that was like the Strokes era. So like, you know, like New York was 
it was like it, Brooklyn was like blowing up. It was like the the last like it was the ending of it. And now if it's four thousand dollars a month for a studio apartment, like how's a musician gonna afford to create? I mean, so there's no real venues left unless you're like you know, a few, but there's very little. It's just very hard. It's very expensive. So I think you've lost the artist community because there's no place for them to go. And the studio scene, I mean, when I was coming up, man, you'd walk up 10th Avenue, you could name out like 30 studios. Yeah. And as a runner, you know, you'd have a cart, you'd be pushing two inch, two inch reels of tape, you know, 15 reels from you know, Avatar to Clinton or to the Hit Factory or to whatever. Down the sidewalk. They were all, yeah, yeah, right down the sidewalk. Uh, right down the side, all the time. You'd be doing that all the time. That's awesome. Or rolling racks of gear from the freight elevator from one studio down to another because it was like a whole community there. And now there's like a few left. Uh, yeah. You know, it's also people don't really need big tracking rooms like they have here at this place. You know, this is a great tracking room. But in the city, to maintain a building like this would cost you like million dollars or something it's crazy. you know it's, crazy. It's, it, it's wild have you been to the power station kind of re restructure i was supposed that to did? go i was supposed to go over the summer and i couldn't work out the timing thing and i got to get back to uh to uh, i got to get in touch with the uh, my friend lauren's a teacher over at berkeley and she hooked me up with the guy steven who runs it over there i just got to get in touch yeah. with him again and set it up yeah it'll be kind of weird to go back there i haven't been there since Last time I did a session there was like 2016 or 17, oh, wow. something like that. Crazy. So, Crazy. Yeah. That's awesome. It's been a long time. That's awesome. Well, I know you got a whole other day of work to do. Uh, so <laughs> so let me give you these these the closing questions of the show. Was there a time in your career that you chose to redefine what success meant to you? To redefine? I think that's just a moving target in, for me anyway, in my career, every level, there's the next step. You know, I could pinpoint when I got my internship as being one thing of success coming from a little 16 track analog studio in central New Jersey with Elisa's reverbs to the power station. That was another level. Then becoming the staff engineer at NBC was another level. And you're like, all right, I'm here now. I can do this. You know, when your first award is like, all right, that's another level. Now that's the next step. And I think probably 2020 when COVID happened and I was like, I need to get back into this. You know, the success maybe isn't about the money right away or about whatever. It's just working with good musicians. Yeah. And making music, making good music. And that to me after mixing, a, it's not that I don't like doing today's show. I love doing it, but I mix a lot of music I don't like. And I don't really have the say, like, I don't want to mix this today. I got to mix it. So I wanted to redefine to me, the success was, getting to just work on the stuff I wanted to work on. Yeah. Really enjoy for me, work with the people that I want to work with. Cause I enjoy working with them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's like, it's huge. It's, we all have to have projects that, you know, just kind of like light us up, you know, cause if you're making a living in music, you're not always doing your favorite music every day. It's just not possible. And it's hard to, if you're lucky enough to do it every day, day in and day out and, getting your butt kicked every day, working hard, it's easy to kind of get jaded with it too, mm -hmm. especially yeah. when you're doing it a long time. Like, so if you don't have those projects that do light you up, you know, you'll just become the old bitter guy. <laughs> it, it happens. It, it happens. And there's a lot the of us studio. out yeah. there. You uh, know? Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of grumpy old engineers. Yeah. Yeah. De definitely. If you walk into a tech shop, which yeah, oh, no, yeah. no so, shade on text, but like every time I, I was at Capitol or uh, in any studio, really, you walk in, you're like, this isn't quite working. And they're like, oh, and I'm like, but yep. you're the one that fixes it. Like, who else am I supposed to say? <laughs> who else am I supposed to ask? OK, so that wasn't just Avatar. All right. <laughs> no, it's that's a tech thing. I think it's like a requirement. You have to be like, oh, what'd you do? And I was like, I didn't do anything. I just took it off the rack. It's just stopped working. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so last question before we go is, uh, what is your current biggest goal that you can share with us? And what's the next smallest step you're going to take to go towards it? Uh, longevity. Mm. Longevity is the goal. I'm, I'm kind of reached maybe like the middle way point of my career. And, you know, it's been about 25 years since I first stepped in a studio to record. And I just hope I can do 25 more in whatever capacity. Yeah. And I think just getting up and doing it on the days that I don't want to do it are 
the little steps. Because, yeah, when it's a 17-hour day and the alarm hits at 1 a.m., there's some days that I don't want to do this. You know? Or I do want to do this, but I'm so tired that I'm going to be kind of like cranky for the first hour and a half of my day until I go, all right, well, I'm not swinging a hammer today. I'm mixing a song, so life is pretty good. Making music. I'm Making just, music. Yeah, I'm pushing faders, so it's not bad. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Dude, this has been great. Please uh, tell people where they can find you if they want to get in touch. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, Matt Rafino, musicmixer.com, and it's Magic Matt Mixing on Instagram. Awesome. I'll put those in the show notes. But yeah, man, this is great. I, I thank you for taking the time and hanging and, yeah, and thanks sharing for having knowledge, me. man. This is uh, this is good. We'll we'll keep in touch. It's my favorite part about the show is just making new friends, you know? Absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. That's it for this week's episode of Progressions. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Be sure to check out all the links and resources mentioned in the episode down below in the video description or in your podcast show notes. If you're listening to this as an audio podcast, please leave a review on Apple or Spotify. It helps the show so much. And if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to drop any thoughts or questions about the episode down below. Let's keep the conversation going. For those of you watching, you'll be getting a link to another episode you might enjoy popping up somewhere right about now. And for those of you listening, check out the YouTube. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and I will see y'all next time.